What's up? First of all, to understand how portosystemic shunts develops, we have to recall splunt mixoculation. Initially, left ventricle push blood into the aorta, and from aorta, blood is going into the splenic artery that supplies blood to the spleen, and mesenteric arteries that supply blood to the intestine, where in mesenteric capillaries fluid exchange occurs. Then blood from the spleen by splenic vein and from the intestine by mesenteric veins is delivered to portal vein. Portal vein drains blood into the liver, where in liver capillaries that we call sinusoids, fluid exchange occurs. From liver capillaries blood is going into the hepatic vein and from hepatic vein blood is drained into the inferior vena cava. I know that. But also we have to know that in this system we have additional vessels that remain from embryogenesis. Such vessels we call portosystemic collateral blood vessels. Back in times of embryogenesis, these vessels were crucial. They provided flow to esophageal and gastric veins. Also they provided flow to paraumbilical and superficial epigastric veins that are located on anterior abdominal wall and also they provided flow to upper anal canal veins. And from all these veins, blood is drained into the inferior vena cava. Look, look, look. Voila! <laughs> it's cool, right? No? Okay, but, um, so we... Adult person in normal condition practically do not use portosystemic collateral vessels, because adult person has portal vein pump line that can provide flow of huge amount of blood. From inferior vena cava, blood goes into the right atrium and right ventricle of the heart. Then blood crosses pulmonary circulation and goes into the left atrium and left ventricle. And from left ventricle, heart again pushes blood into the aorta, so this cycle can be repeated over and over again. The reason that makes portal vein pump line so good is a large radius. To explain this, we have to recall that blood flow in cardiovascular system is equal to pressure difference divided on resistance. So, in this case, both portal vein pump line and portosystemic collateral vessels deliver blood from the portal vein to inferior vena cava. So, pressure difference will be the same, and in both cases will be equal to hydrostatic pressure inside the portal vein minus hydrostatic pressure inside the inferior vena cava. But, as we see, the destination is the same, but the roads are different. Each road has its own resistance, and, as we know, resistance is inversely proportional to the force power of radius. Portal vein pump line consists of large vessels. They have a big radius, and big radius gives them low resistance. And low resistance creates a huge flow. In contrast to portal vein pump line, portosystemic collateral vessels have small radius. Small radius gives them a high resistance, and high resistance causes a low flow. For example, let's suppose that resistance in portosystemic collateral vessels is 99 times greater than in portal vein pump line. So, in this case, from 1000 ml of blood that comes into the portal vein, 990 ml goes into the portal vein pump line and only 10 milliliters goes into the portosystemic collateral vessels. Well, think about it. <laughs> so, as you see, in normal condition we practically do not use them. But it turns out that these vessels are of vital importance for us, because in case of emergency, as in case of portal hypertension, they provide decompression of portal circulation. You didn't know that? Seriously? Am I done here? Son of a bitch, you know, you're really no help at all, you know that? Hey, language! So the concept here is that if something causes an obstruction to portal vein pump line, it can be obstruction of the hepatic vein, or obstruction of the liver sinusoids, or obstruction in a distal region of the portal vein. In this case, fluid begins to accumulate in portal vein. Let's take as an example thrombosis of liver sinusoids. So, thrombosis causes an obstruction to liver sinusoids. With obstruction, radius at this particular region of the liver sinusoid decreases. If radius decreases, then resistance increases. And with increase in resistance, blood flow through this region decreases. So, blood begins to accumulate proximal to the obstruction inside the portal vein. 
The problem with it is that with increasing volume of fluid, hydrostatic pressure inside the portal vein increase. It's a condition known as portal hypertension. With increasing hydrostatic pressure, the wall tension increases, and at some point it can cause rupture of the vessel. So to explain this, there is a vessel with fluid inside it. Fluid flow occurs from left to right, and fluid has some hydrostatic pressure. And as we know, hydrostatic pressure acts in all directions. Recall that hydrostatic pressure is basically a weight of fluid that acts on a particular area. And weight of fluid equals to mass of fluid times gravity constant. In turn, mass of fluid equals to fluid density times fluid volume. So basically, volume and hydrostatic pressure are directly related. Also, we have to know that because hydrostatic pressure acts in all directions, it determines the wall tension. Recall that wall tension is determined by the Laplace law. Laplace law states that the wall tension is equal to pressure difference between the pressure that acts from the inside of the blood vessel minus pressure that acts from the outside of the blood vessel. Also, wall tension is directly proportional to the radius of the vessel and inversely proportional to the thickness of the vessel. So the higher the volume of fluid inside the vessel, the higher becomes hydrostatic pressure. And with increase in hydrostatic pressure, wall tension increase. You see, there is only one constant. One universal, it is the only real cause. Causality. Action, reaction, cause and effect. So, for example, in this case, thrombus is formed, and thrombus causes an obstruction, thereby flow decreases and fluid begins to accumulate inside the vein. With increase in fluid volume inside the vessel, hydrostatic pressure increases. With increase in hydrostatic pressure, wall tension increases. So this will cause distension of the blood vessel. With time, or if obstruction by thrombus will become more severe, more fluid will accumulate. With increase in fluid volume, hydrostatic pressure increase. With increase in hydrostatic pressure, wall tension increase. Increase in wall tension will cause a more significant distension of the blood vessel. And if obstruction will become even more severe, so more fluid will accumulate inside the blood vessel, then hydrostatic pressure increase even further. With increase in hydrostatic pressure, wall tension increase. And if wall tension reach a critical level, rupture of the vessel occurs. So the force created by hydrostatic pressure that acts on blood vessel wall at some point will prevail over the ability of the vessel wall to distend, and when this happens, rupture of the vessel occurs. So portal hypertension, in fact, it's a very dangerous condition. How to deal with it? Obviously, ideally is to remove thrombus that cause an obstruction, but it's a relatively long-term perspective. So somehow we should provide the compression of the portal vein, and it's the moment when portosystemic lateral vessels come into play. All right, you're like this. So if obstruction in liver sinusoid occurs, radius decrease, thereby resistance increase. For example, let's suppose that resistance becomes 10 times greater than before. With increase in resistance, flow through portal vein pump line decrease, and simultaneously, flow through portosystemic collateral vessels will increase. So now from 1000 ml of blood, 900 ml is going to portal vein pump line, and approximately 100 is going into the portosystemic collateral vessels. You made that up, did I now? Now, let's suppose that obstruction becomes even more severe. So radius decrease even further. Thereby, resistance increase, for example, resistance becomes 30 times greater than normal. So now from 1000 ml of blood, approximately 700 ml is going to portal vein pump line, and approximately 300 ml is going to portosystemic collateral vessels. So portosystemic collateral vessels, in case of portal hypertension, provide partial decompression of the portal vein. As we see, they take on them 300 ml of blood. Because otherwise, this volume of fluid will progressively accumulate inside the portal vein, and at some point will cause rupture of the portal vein. 
Because these vessels provide blood flow from portal vein into the inferior vena cava, they called porta systemic. Systemic because inferior vena cava is one of the largest veins, also called systemic veins. Demo dogs? Demogorgon dogs. Demo dogs. It's like a compound. It's like, it's like a play on words, you know? Okay. Like it. And because they provide flows that bypass liver, they call chunks. Because in normal condition, blood should go through the liver tissue. But these vessels provide blood flow from portal vein directly into the inferior vena cava. So that's why we call them portosystemic shunts. Demodogs. I'm sorry, what? I said, uh, demodogs. Like demogorgon and dogs. Like, you put them together, it sounds pretty badass. How is this important right now? It's not, I'm sorry. And it will be a happy ending, but there is a problem. You see, we practically do not use portosystemic lateral vessels. And without stimulation by work, any tissue or any vessel undergo atrophy or do not further develop. So these portosystemic lateral vessels are underdeveloped. In fact, they are very very narrow. But as any vein, they are capable to distend. And as we see, the more severe becomes the obstruction, the more severe become portal hypertension. And the more severe become portal hypertension, the more volume of fluid is going into the portosystemic lateral vessels. I don't feel good about this. I don't feel good about what this! What do you feel good about anything? To illustrate this, there is a blood vessel with fluid inside it, and fluid flow occurs from left to right. And fluid has its own hydrostatic pressure. Here we see a formula of hydrostatic pressure, we see that hydrostatic pressure and volume are directly related. And here we see the formula of wall tension, and wall tension is determined by the hydrostatic pressure inside the vessel. So in this case, with increasing fluid inflow, more volume of fluid will be located inside the vessel. With increasing volume, hydrostatic pressure inside the vessel increase. With increasing hydrostatic pressure, wall tension increase. Increasing wall tension cause vessel wall distension. Because collateral vessels are veins, and veins have very high compliance, they can be very easily distended, basically they are like a balloons. And such over-distended veins be called varices. Distension of esophageal veins and gastric veins cause formation of esophageal varices and gastric varices. Distension of paraumbilical and superficial epigastric veins cause formation of caput medusa on anterior abdominal wall. And distension of upper anal canal veins cause formation of hemorrhoids. The problem with varices is that the more distended they become, the higher is the chance of their rupture. So, the more severe becomes portal hypertension, the more volume of fluid inflow to portosystemic collateral vessels. With increasing volume of fluid, hydrostatic pressure inside the vessel increase. With increase of hydrostatic pressure, wall tension increase. Increasing wall tension cause more severe vessel wall distension. And this time, if portal hypertension becomes even more severe, even more fluid volume will pass through collateral vessels. So, if portal hypertension becomes even more severe, this will cause increase in fluid inflow to collateral veins. Increase in volume of fluid cause increase in hydrostatic pressure. Increase in hydrostatic pressure cause increase in wall tension. And when wall tension reach a critical level, the force that is applied by hydrostatic pressure to blood vessel wall will prevail over the ability of the vessel wall to distend. And when this happens, critical wall tension cause rupture of the blood vessel. Rupture of the esophageal varices will cause upper GI bleeding. Rupture of hemorrhoids can cause lower GI bleeding. Also flow that bypass liver is non-physiologic. Recall that liver provides detoxification. In normal condition, portal vein pump line delivers blood to the liver, where liver makes from dangerous ammonia molecules a urea molecule, which is less harmful substance. And also liver provides conjugation of bilirubin. And only after, blood is going to inferior vena cava. But blood that inflow to shunts bypass liver. Thereby blood do not undergo any detoxification, 
So first of all, it causes increase in blood ammonia level that causes hepatic encephalopathy, and also it causes increase in free bilirubin level. And in addition to this, it prolongs the half-life of drugs. Great. Fine. Yep. Ciao! What's that mean? Ciao. It's Italian. It means food. 